All right, you guys ready to enter into the joy of the Lord? That's what we're talking about. Yeah, all of you, the joy of the Lord. You know, there's a verse in the scripture in the Old Testament uh, that says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I'm not preaching on the joy of the Lord being your strength today, but I do want to remind you that the, the word tells us that the joy of the Lord is what strengthens us. It's what motivates our life. It, it, it's what gives us uh, the ability to move forward, to go on, to walk through things. Uh, the joy of the Lord is a tremendous gift of grace by the Spirit of God to our life. And without joy, it's really difficult to face every day, especially these days that we're in. You guys do recognize that we're in some pretty, pretty tough times, right? As a matter of fact, I was... Uh, I was talking with Brian yesterday, Bill. We must have wore, we wore Brian out. Brian, if you're at home watching, which I don't know whether Brian would, would be or not, but uh, is Brian Techno Tammy? Is Brian, does he watch stuff? Yeah, well, he's probably watching. Well, I hate to talk about. He's one of my killer bees. I don't know if you guys know this, but Beverly, Billy, and Brian are, are the killer bees, and they, uh, they uh, talk to me while I'm preaching. They help me, you know, and I'm missing one of my bees today. But we did a lot of work. We did a lot of work late yesterday, and some some things with some of our members, you know, helping and so forth. And uh, and so anyway, he's. Uh, I think he kind of overdoes at times. He forgets that uh, he's not supposed to do some stuff. I don't know if any of you ever do that or not, but he forgets he's not supposed. To. But I was talking with him yesterday, and we were talking on the way home. I was riding back with him, and. We were talking about uh, the book of Revelation and about the end times and about these days that we're in and so forth. And uh, he made the comment to me. He said, you know, he said, ever since I came to the Lord, uh, I've, uh, you know, Revelation and what God's doing for the end times and, and all of that have been something that's been on my mind as a Christian. You know, before I became to the Lord, I didn't really worry about it. But since I came to the Lord, it's become obvious that these days that we're in are are um, some very uh, prophetic days and some perilous, prophetic, uh, perplexing days that we live in. And he said, you know, when I first came to the Lord um, uh, several years, well, I guess it's been like, like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, something like that. He said, I, I, I didn't think that I would actually live to see the Lord come. You know, he said, I just thought it, you know, it might be, it's out there somewhere for me. But he said, in these last days that we're in now, in these days, he said, I'm beginning to wonder more and more and more if, if I'm not going to be here alive when the Lord comes. And I don't know if you're sensing that also, but I'm telling you, if you are, uh, you're with a lot of other Christian believers who believe that these are some very, uh, prophetic days that we're in, and it's leading to the things that the Lord describes. And, and uh, when I was in, uh, started preaching some 40-something years ago, uh, I preached on the book of Revelation because I was young, and it was exciting and, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff, captivating for young people and all of that. We love drama, and I, you know, when we're young, we love drama. And, so the book of Revelation, full of drama, full of everything like that. So we preached on it quite a bit. The only trouble was back then, this was like the 70s. Back then, it was, uh, to me, how in the world would this ever happen? You know, it was like some of the things that were described, it was like, how would that ever happen? How could one person control the finances of the world? That would just be one, one question. Well, we don't have to ask that anymore, do we? One button and you out of business, baby, I'm telling you. Somebody pushes one button, you have nothing, and you can get nothing, and you can do nothing about it. It's just unbelievable. You are like sealed and cleared and everything because you're a number now. And, uh, and I'm telling you, man, it's just amazing. But, but the point being, in days like these, see, the Lord, I, I know we don't know what's going to happen. We don't. We have no idea what's going to happen. I don't even know what's going to happen the rest of the day, much less what's going to happen uh, five years from now, ten years from now, should there be a five or ten years from now. I have no idea what's going to happen, but the Lord does. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And this stuff is not a surprise to the Lord. He's aware of this. He was aware from the foundations of the world that you guys would be here right now and that I would be here right now. 
And so it didn't sneak up on God. God's not looking around heaven going, oh my goodness, what in the world am I going to do? God has a plan and God's moving according to that plan and he's aware. And so one of the great benefits that God did from the foundations of the world was he gave us his word and his word is there to comfort us and to strengthen us and to inform us and to, and to prepare us so that we can be ready for whatever happens. And in that vein, books like Philippians, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church while Paul was in prison awaiting the, the end of his life, actually. Paul's in prison on trumped up charges, you know, and he's there awaiting whatever the Roman government would do to him, which is going to be kill him. Uh, and while he's there, the Spirit of God is moving inside the Apostle Paul about some of the places that he's established along the way, some of the groups of believers like us. I mean, we could very easily be the church at Philippi. Very easily could be that. It's a group of people just like us that came to the Lord. And many of you that have come to the Lord, you, you, haven't, you haven't been with the Lord a long time. You, you've just come to the Lord. You didn't grow up in church. You, you didn't have any relationship. Your family didn't have any relationship with the Lord. This is all new to you. This is, you know, this is like, I'm, I'm just a babe. And, and, and I don't, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to grow and, and, and teach me about the Lord. And, and that was the same as the church at Philippi. None of those people at Philippi had been Christians very long because Christ had just left, you know. I mean, it, nobody was a Christian for a very long time during these days. These were Jewish people. These were people that grew up in a very, very regimented religion. And as you are aware, because I've uh, quoted it, I've, I've talked about it several times, religion is what we do to try to get to God. Religion is what we practice to try to please God, try to know God, try to have a future with God. That's what religion is. It's a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of regulations. It's rituals. It's things we do and things we go through and things we learn and things we practice in order to hopefully please God. Now, Jesus has nothing to do with religion. I just want you to know this. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus doesn't have anything to do with religion. Jesus doesn't have anything to do with religion, and I'm telling you, he didn't. You read your scripture, you look at the New Testament, Jesus had absolutely nothing to do with religion except he opposed it all the time. He 100% opposed religion at every opportunity. And that's actually what got him killed. Uh, I mean, other than, of course, that it was the purpose of God, but Physically speaking, uh, manually speaking, it was the fact that Jesus was so contrary to Judaism in the fact that he said he was God. He said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father's voice because the Father and I are one. And they said, what did he say? Did he just say that he was God? And of course, the petitions began to, 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 to round. Get rid of Jesus. He's a heretic. He's blasphemous. He's claiming that he's God. Imagine this. And during all of these seasons of time, the Holy Spirit of God, the same one that lives in you, if you know Christ, the same exact Holy Spirit that is living on the inside of you was empowering Jesus Christ as part of the Godhead, you know, as part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of life. And that Holy Spirit that knew everything about everything that was going to happen in connection with Jesus and the church and everything in our life is the Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of us right now. Not surprised, not surprised by anything that is going on in this crazy old world we're living in. 
not caught off guard by anything. That's why it's important to understand that you're here today in a place that's been designed in order to share with you what, as a human being and as other human beings, sense is God's word for you and for us, God's word for us. Because we're all in this together. We're a family. And God has a word for us. And God has other families. And God, God is inspiring, inspiring words for them. And, word, and, and none of this has surprised God whatsoever. So a book like Philippians, a book about joy, he says, you're going to need this. And so the apostle Paul begins to pin out sitting in a prison cell. Imagine this now. Imagine this. Sitting in a prison cell on trumped up charges. How bitter could you be? I mean, how angry could you be? These people have me in prison for something I didn't do. And you could be just blown out of the water and focused on nothing but trying to get out of there and prove that you did not do what they said. But instead of being overwhelmed and overcome with thoughts like that, the Apostle Paul is overwhelmed by the Spirit of God who begins to speak to him and tell him, here's what you need. Here's what, here's what you need to write to this little tiny group of believers in Philippi. You need to remind them that when times get tough, don't lose your joy. Don't lose your joy. Because your joy is the key to your life and making it through these desperate days that we're in. And so in four chapters, four chapters here, the Apostle Paul says over and over. And you remember last week, one of the scriptures we read, we read the first 11 chapters of the uh, first 11 verses of the third chapter. And in one of those verses, it said, look. What I'm writing to you is not tedious to me, <laughs> even though I've said it before. It's not tedious. It's, 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 it's the safety of your life. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. Don't forget about rejoicing in the Lord. And so he talks to us in these four chapters about how to be joyful in spite of circumstances, how to be joyful in spite of people, how to be joyful in spite of uh, issues and, and concerns and cares and money and possessions and anxiety, which is worrying about people and circumstances and possessions. You know. How to be joyful in spite of all of these things. And the Apostle Paul writes, and, and if you'll just excuse me one second because I am a theologian and a pastor, and so I, I fall into this little stuff every now and then, every now and then, but, but just as a, as a little happy, you know, thought, um, if you look at the book, the Apostle Paul writes about chapter three that we're in right now, and we'll read some verses in just a second. We read 11 of them last week, and we looked at the Apostle Paul's life. Chapter 3 is an autobiography. It's a story written by himself, about himself. And in the first 11 verses, Paul compares his life, which we'll just use the term analogy. Paul compares his life to an accountant. And he says, all that stuff that I thought was gain to me, I now see that it was loss. And I count it all as rubbish, as garbage for the sake of reaching Jesus Christ. He said, if some of you folks think you have something to brag about in life, I've got so much stuff in my life that I could brag about. It would just blow your mind. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was zealous. I was a Pharisee. I persecuted the church. Nobody had more energy than me. I did everything right so nobody could say, you don't go to church and you didn't get baptized. Me. Nobody could accuse me of anything. And all of that stuff in my life, you know what it was? Just garbage. 
It meant absolutely nothing because it's Jesus that matters. And so the Paul, Apostle Paul talks to us as an accountant about his past. He says, this is how I used to be. This is what my life was about. Today, the first thing he begins to talk to us about is about winning a race, about a prize that people who win things receive when they win things. So the Apostle Paul now starts telling us about his present, and he compares his present to being an athlete. He says, you know, my life like an athlete, I run a race. And I run as hard as I can because there's only one runner in a race that's going to win the prize. And then he looks at us and he says, so run the race in order to win the prize. And his presence is compared to an athletic event. And then in the last few verses that we'll read today, it talks about his future. So he talked to us about his past. He's going to talk to us about his present. And then he's going to talk to us about his future. And he talked as an accountant and he talked as an athlete. And then in the last, he talks as a, uh, uh, forgive me because of the alliteration of A's. I can't resist that kind of stuff. As an alien, he says, this world's not my home. Even though I'm here now, I'm not going to always be here. There's laid up. There's, there's a heaven awaiting me. There's a prize. And, and, and this right here is not my home. It's temporary, right? That's right. And so he's just, it's amazing how God speaks to his people. And he's speaking, he's speaking to us guys. He's telling us, look, these days you're in, these days we're in, I don't think it's a surprise to a single one of us that these days that we're in, uh, I mean, they're, they're just, they're a snowball rolling downhill. And, and there seems to be no answer to them. I mean, it's perplexing. One of the things that the book of Matthew talks about in connection with the end times, Jesus was asked, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting all off on all this, but... I'll run him back around. Maybe we'll run him back around. We'll get, it. we'll get this rabbit caught here in a minute. But, but, but one of the things Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew in the, in the 20, 24th and 25th chapter, you know, he's talking about end time things. If you've ever read it, you've, you've, you've seen that. Uh, he was asked a question. Here was his question. The question the disciples said is, uh, when are these things that you're talking about going to happen? In other words, uh, when are you going to, uh, to come back again? And then what will be the sign of your coming? And then what will be the sign of the end of the age? So there are three questions asked, not just one. There are three, and they're not the same question. Jesus coming and the end of the age are not the same thing. And so Jesus starts answering these questions, and one of the th answers to the question about when, how can we know that, that you're close to coming? How can we be prepared for that? Jesus said one of the signs will be that there will be, there will be trouble with perplexity. You know what perplexity means? It means there's no answer. And just let me ask you, if somebody said, all right, you're the king of the universe, what's the answer to the issues of this world we're in right now? How can there be peace between Israel and the Palestinians? How can there be peace between different cultures? How can terrorism be controlled? How can you stop that from happening? What how would you answer that? What would you say? Do you have an answer? Do you know what the answer might be? Neither do I. You know why? It's perplexing. There is no answer to it, actually, is what the reason is. And it'll still be happening when Jesus comes again. Only the Prince of Peace will put an end to all of that kind of stuff. But the point being that these are some tough days. So, therefore, the book of Philippians uh, should speak to us with some encouragement about these days we live in. How many of you ha want to be a success in life? Let me, let me see you. You say, I want to be successful. All right, are there any losers in here that don't want to be successful? Okay, I see you. I see you. Well, then don't listen. 
because I want to tell you how to be successful. You know, I've, uh, if, you, if, you want to be a, if you want to be a millionaire, write a book on being successful. It just seems that way. I mean, the bookstores are full of books on being successful, right? And a lot of these books are written by people who haven't been successful in life. They'll be successful if you buy their book, you know, and that, that kind of thing. <laughs> you open it up, it has like one page in there. Buy my book, be successful. But, uh, I, but, but I don't know about you. If I want to be successful, I want to hear how to be successful from somebody who's, who, who is successful or at least has been successful. And this is where I quoted a while ago that I learn more from models than I do from manuals. And what I watch and what I perceive and the way you live, I learn more from that than I do from some book that is written by somebody with some points in it. And I think most of us do. And who is our model for success as Christians? Jesus is our model for success, right? To be like Jesus would be successful for us. Now, Comparing to Jesus and coming up behind Jesus, not as successful as Jesus, but someone that would be closely modeling Jesus would have to be the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul lived life to the fullest. He took life to the extreme. I mean, I, would, I think you would have to say that his, the life that the Apostle Paul lived for the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ was a phenomenal life lived for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul probably did more than any other single person, not, not Jesus being considered as a person, but as any other single person to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ was carried to the world and still remains after 2,000 years of life. We're still reading books like Philippians and Ephesians and Galatians and Colossians and Titus and you know, Romans, Corinthians. These are all books that the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, wrote. And, and, and so he's a very successful person. So here, here's, my, here's my, my preface about this. If we want to be successful and we want to we model our life after somebody who is successful, who better could we find than someone like the Apostle Paul? And if we could talk to him and say, man, how... Were you so successful in life? And let him just tell us, and we would take our pencil, and we would write down what it is he said that we need to do in order for, for us to be successful in life, then we would be happy about that, right? You would gladly say, I'll go down to the Coliseum and see Paul and write down what he says I can do to be successful. Well, I've got some good news for you. You don't have to go to the Coliseum. We have it right here today for you. And this is what Paul says is successful in life. Now, let me read a few passages. Let's just get, get flowing in the passage, and then I'll come back. All right, not that I've... Oh, by the way, I love last week, you know, the first scripture we read last week in verse 1 of chapter 3 was finally, right? Finally. Paul said, finally, my brethren. And then he goes on for two more chapters. So I, I just... <laughs> I'm just feeling, you know, akin to that. I just, you know, it makes me feel comfortable that I'm not the only one that can't quit talking. All right, so here we go. Not, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus has laid hold of you. <laughs> yeah, Jesus has laid hold of you. I know you're going, me? No, no. Yeah, yeah. If you belong to him, he's laid hold of you. And there's a reason why he laid hold of you. And the apostle Paul says, look, what I'm doing is I'm just, ke I keep pressing on. Everybody say, plow on. <laughs> Tanya, Tanya shared the poem with you, right? You remember the poem? You remember all the words to the poem, plow on? All right, say it with me. Plow on, plow on, plow on, plow on. Plow on, plow on, plow on. Plow on, plow on, plow on, plow on. Plow on, plow on, plow on. That's the poem. Plow on, plow on. The Apostle Paul said, I'm plowing on, babe. I'm plowing on because I want to achieve that for which Jesus Christ 
grabbed hold of me. Jesus had a purpose. I want to accomplish whatever purpose that is. And so he goes on, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Everybody say, got it made. That's what that means. I don't count myself to have it made. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Uh, Say, be teachable. Uh, Be teachable, okay? So if you're not thinking right and God corrects your thinking, let him correct it, and don't be thinking crazy anymore, all right? Uh, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, unified authority, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in, my, in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. In other words, pay attention to the people that are living for the Lord and accomplishing and are successful and watch them and pattern your life after them. That's not really complicated, is it? Paul said, look, watch it and do it. For many, the reason why is because he's going to tell us this old world we live in. Look what what he says. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. What kind of characteristics do they have? And I'll talk about them in a minute. But whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. And they set their mind on earthly things. People that do those four things, enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. For our citizenship is in heaven. There, there's your alien deal right there. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. I tell you, Paul could really write. Here's the first thing Paul says I need to do to be successful. Number one, I must face my faults. It's the principle of evaluation. That's what the word evaluation up there means. And if you live by principles, there's your good one. The principle of evaluation. The principle of evaluation just basically says, look, um, I need to do an evaluation of my life and I need to admit where I have strengths and where I have weaknesses. Uh, This is important because it's impossible to know where you are going if you don't know where you are. You, are you feeling me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. If you said, if I said to you, I called you and I said, how do I get to your house? What would you say to me? Where are you? Right? Because the first thing you got to know is, all right, if I'm going to tell you how to get here, I got to know where you are. And I'm just saying that to you as an effort to be a successful person The first thing that you have to know about yourself is you have to know where you are strong and where you are weak. And you have to look at your own life and you have to admit it to yourself. Did you know that transparency is a sign of of mental wellness? In other words, the more transparent I can be with you, the more I can let my light shine out, the more I try to... Uh, to not hide myself and to not become something I'm not and to try to keep you from knowing the real me. The more transparent I am, the more mentally well I am. Uh, The more I try to hide myself and cover myself and and, and hide myself from you, the the worse it is for me. So it's a sign of of emotional security for me to, to... to be transparent. And so what the Apostle Paul say, and look in verse, in verse 12. Wait a minute, uh-oh. I knew I was going to do that. Here we are. Verse 12. Not that I have all written it. Now, now notice I said you must evaluate yourself. Now look at what he says about himself. Now, I'm telling you, and if anybody had anything to brag about, it would be the Apostle Paul. If there was anybody in this room that could look at us and say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm just really pretty good, you know. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really, I really got it all together. And I, you know, I don't know really a lot of things that uh, I could just talk about that might not be, you know, good. I mean, if there was anybody like that, it would certainly be the Apostle Paul that could say something. But notice, here he is, an old man. He's in prison. 
And he's talking about the parts of his life that he sees he needs to work. He says, not that I have already attained. In other words, I'm not talking about the fact that I've arrived. Have you ever, have you ever been around anybody that they thought they arrived? Are they good to be? <laughs> Do those, are those people successful in anything? Well, yeah, they are successful in running other people away from themselves, right? I mean, they're 100% successful at, at, at eliminating people from their life. But the Apostle Paul says, look, I'm not telling you, I'm not coming to you as a person who says that I've, all, that, that I've arrived, that I've already arrived. I know I got some ways to go or that I'm already perfected. Now, let me talk to you about being perfect for just a second. Uh, and again, uh, forgiveness, uh, theology, forgiveness. Being perfect. Is anybody in this room perfect? All right. None of us are perfect, right? We know that. We know we're not perfect. All right, when the Bible talks about us being perfect, what is it talking about? I mean, like the Apostle Paul right here, he said, not, hey, look, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, not that I'm perfected. Well, the Bible talks about us being perfect. Well, I don't even need to get into all that because I don't, I, that's too much for that. All right, let's go on path. But Paul says, I'm not being perfect. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. I don't think I've got it made. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the mark. I'm just saying to you that the Apostle Paul did the same thing that I'm encouraging you to do. And I think this is what Philippians is encouraged, encouraging us to do, is to do a personal inventory of our life and, and ask this kind of question. And it's in your note. Uh, uh, where do I need to change? Because there's some part of me that, that, that's, that, that's hindering me. You know, it's just amazing to me how often people just repeat patterns over and over and over and over again. You've seen this, right? You've watched it in your family. You've watched people sabotage their own lives, right? They'll be going along, things will be going good, things will be going well, they'll be doing things that are helping their life, and then all of a sudden, boom, they'll stop doing it, they'll, they'll go back to something that they left behind that was horrible for them, they'll make a bad choice, they just sabotage their own life. In order to be successful, the first thing it takes is, I've got to, I've got to know where I am, I've got to know my strengths, I've got to know my weaknesses, and I need to ask myself, now I'm not saying ask your wife. Or ask your husband, or ask your children. I'm saying, you. This is for you. This is not what they need to do. This is what you need to do. Where do I need to change my life? Number two. All right. All right. You said you'd go to the Colosseum and listen to what he said. All right. Here's what he's saying to you. All right. <laughs> Number two. I must forget the former, which is the principle of elimination. In other words, there's some stuff I got to get out of my life. I've got to stop letting my past and my memories manipulate my life. I cannot allow what happened in the past to affect my present. Because if it affects my present, it's certainly going to interrupt my future. Now, right, it's going to take me back. Look, look, at, what he, look, at, look at what he said. Uh, not that I've already attained, uh, going down to verse 13, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are bad. What is the Apostle Paul saying? Apostle Paul is saying, look, I've got to stop wasting time on yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday is gone. Today is the day, and I've got to let those things go, and I can't be manipulated by those things which happened in my past, or I'll never live my present. I'll never live my, my, my future. One of the statements that we make every service is this little verse right here. You see it? But forget all that. Forget all that. Well, you know, I didn't. Forget all that. Well, they treat me. Forget all that. Well, they should. Forget all that. But forget all that. God says, look, where I'm taking you and what I have for you is so much greater than what you've left behind. Man, forget all of that. You can't drag that along into this new direction we're going in. 
If you find people walking around a lot of times, they walk around just like this. All, and, and, and here's God got, got this ladder for us to climb, and it's going with him. And, 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 and in order to get on that ladder, man, we got we to gotta drop all this baggage that we're carrying with us. Because we can't carry that with us into this new life that God has for us. And so he says, look, you know, if you're going to be successful in life, all right, you have to, first of all, know where you are and, and come clean at least to yourself about what your strengths and weaknesses are. You got to know that. And secondly, you got to let that stuff that happened in the past go. You got to forget all that. Now, let me ask you, how do you forget it? Well, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. Here's how you forget it. Get you a good, nice, uh, you know, about a 33-inch Louisville slugger and um, <laughs> polish it up real nice and give it to your mate and say, here, uh, crown me with that thing, would you, right now? <laughs> <laughs> Electric shock treatment, is that what you would prefer? Well, that'll work, too. That'll work, too. Now, no, you know we can't do that, right? I mean, I'm just... But, but... But that would be about the only way that you could totally forget something, or electric shock treatment. Um, that might wipe it out of your mind, so you would forget it. When we, say, when we say we have to forget some things, we have to forget the former, what are we really saying? I'm, you can't forget. I mean, you can't totally forget. Barring some medical issue going on in your life, you cannot totally forget, Right? Some of you still remember stuff happened 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, it's stuff, and, and it's still there, and you say, well, I can still remember. Yeah, and that's why you have to have grace in your life to go past what you can remember. Look, what that really means is it means don't dwell on it. That's what it really means. It means, look, even though I can remember what happened, don't dwell on that. Don't let that be the focus of your life because if you do, it's going to mess up your present and certainly mess up your future. So I've got to, I, 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 I got to evaluate and then I got to forget what's back there. I don't dwell on what's back there. Oh yeah, it's back there. Look, if you could totally forget the bad stuff that's happened in your life, you wouldn't need the grace of God to help you get over it, right? Right? Because if I could tell, look, hey, if you offend me, you hurt me, you do something, and, 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 and you come to me and you say, oh, pastor, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Please forgive me. And if I, if I could forget, I would look at you and say, forgive what? what? You know why? Because I forgot. Now, that doesn't take any grace or mercy. All that takes is a bad memory. But what? the kingdom of God is about, is about even though I can remember, I offer grace and forgiveness. Even though I remember exactly what you did to me, I remember exactly what you said to me, I remember what it did, but I'm going to let it go because you asked me to let it go. And, I'm gonna, and this ain't never happened again, right? All right, never happened again. I'm kidding. Wes is the sweetest guy, man. He, he's never done anything. It is. I'm really, I'm really uh, venting right now. Um, but, but anyway, all right, let's move on. All right, number three. All right, here's the thing. All right, I got to evaluate, then I got to forget the former. Number three, I must focus on the future. Now, I'm just in connection with this. Uh, being successful, moving forward, uh, the joy of the Lord, moving your life. It's not just a matter of forgetting the past. Because, you know, you could have amnesia and forget the past. It's more than that. It's not just forgetting the past. You have to focus on, on what lies ahead. Fo yeah, a new goal, really. And that's exactly true because successful people, and I know you don't want to hear this, and I know I don't like to hear this either because I'm a spontaneous person and I don't really like to plan a lot of stuff. I don't know if y'all picked up on that or not. But I'm married to the general manager of the universe, so I just want y'all to, to know that. <laughs> who, does, who does administrate and keeps me on the track? Um, but, um, and it's really funny, you know, I'm 60-something years old, and uh, I'm still kicking against the rules, you know, somehow. But anyway, um, the, uh, and, and, and Tanya's the administrator holding my foot to the, you know, fire here, you know. And, uh, and but, but, 
This is what you don't want to hear, but it's true. Successful people are goal-oriented people. To be successful, you have to... You have, to, you have to be striving for something. I mean, it's like, hey, what are you trying to do? Well, I don't know. What am I trying to do? Yeah. Well, are you going to be successful? Not likely. Not likely. Unless you win the lottery or something other like that, you know, and then we're going to all come. Then we're all going to come take the money from you because you don't have enough sense to manage it because you just got it dropped in your lap, you know. Look at people that win the lottery. Most of the time, five years later, they broke, they bankrupt, everything else. Why? Because you've got to have some character to manage millions of dollars, right? It's not just the money, it's the character to go with it, you know, that matters. But anyway, I digress. Um, you've got to focus on the future because it, 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 uh, if you're not striving toward a goal, then you're not going to attain the goal. And let me show you what Paul says. See, he says it better than I do. Uh, he says, brethren, I, I don't count myself to have arrived. I don't have it set counted. I don't count to have it made. Uh, but one thing I do, not 40 things I dabble in. This one thing I do. Now that right there is focus. Who put this water up here, by the way? Isaac, Isaac you crafty fellow. When did he do that? He walked right past me? Well, there you go. I'm busy. That's right. Thank you, Lawrence. I'm going to put you in the bees, even though you're Lawrence. All right. So here he is. He says this one thing. Now, I'm just saying this to all of us because I don't know if you're like me. But if you are, you might be infected by a little disease called fragmentosis. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? That's, fragmentosis means I'm, I'm dabbling in so many different things, I really can't pay attention to anything. Really. You know, well, maybe you, a little, maybe you got a little fragmentosis going on, and, and, and that's not going to lead to success because... You can't spread yourself that thin and be successful in life. You have to have some focus going on in life. And the Apostle Paul says, look, I have boiled life down to one thing. And this one thing I do. Now, let me just ask you, what is that thing for you? What, it, what, what is it you want to be successful in life? You know, you want to be, want to be rich? Is that, would that be successful? Well, then you need to focus on that and you need to begin to do everything you can do in order to be rich. You know, start being stingier than you probably are. Because I don't know if you've noticed it, but a lot of rich people are stingy. I don't know if you notice that. Not, maybe not every single one of them, but, but a lot of them are. You know, you'd think, you'd think that they could let a nickel go, but, but they won't let a nickel go. And <laughs> I mean, they don't let anything go. Isn't it? So you're going to need to, you need to go and start focusing on stuff like that. Get a career, you know, uh, uh, get an education, uh, go for the best job you can. I mean, you have, what's important to you? What is that one thing that you're striving for? Is that one thing that I would please Christ, that I would love the Lord, that I would uh, obey him, that I would follow his path for my life? Then, then search for that. Uh, be involved in study. Take advantage of every opportunity you can to hear from the Lord and read the Word and pray. And I, I mean, you, you see what I'm saying. I'm just saying to you that if you're going to be successful, you have to you know, know what, where you are, and then you have to forget all that other junk, and then you got to focus on, what do I want? Where am I going? What is this about? I can't just float through life dabbling in everything and, and be successful in an area of life. That's what the apostle says. Look, he's, this one thing I do, buddy, I, I'm, I, my whole life has been narrowed down to one point. Um, and I, this, is a, this is a verse uh, that I've quoted, in, and I love it. He said, do you, not, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? This is 1 Corinthians 9. But one receives the prize, run in such a way as to obtain it. Uh, everybody in a race is running the race. They're all running for the prize, but only one of them gets it. So if you want to be successful in life, you got to run in order to win the race. Not just to participate in the race. 
You don't get a participation trophy in life, all right? You got to run to win the race. I know in this modern society that we're in, we hardly even remember the word win because everybody gets a trophy for just being there, you know. But the Apostle Paul says in the spiritual life, it's not that way. In the spiritual life, you're running a race for eternity. Run it in such a way as to win the race. Hey, the, uh, the, uh, oh, the results are, what would I say? The, uh, anyway, uh, the, the results are too disastrous if you don't win. So it's really critical that you do that. Number four, here's the last one. The principle of determination, I must fight to the finish. I must fight to the finish. I don't know anything about that, brother. I know some of you did. You stayed up late. That's why you can't half stay up now. Fight to the finish. This just means that this just means that 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 life is a battle. And of course, that's not a surprise to any of us. And that nothing worthwhile happens in life without a great deal of effort. And if you, like me, have heard a lot of testimonies in life, I think you've been surprised by one thing about testimonies. Most of the testimonies you hear from people who have done great things, they're just normal people, right? <laughs> you say, look at that. They are so normal. I think of David Ring every time I think, think of the word normal. But they're just normal people that have done outstanding things. And the reason why is because they are determined to walk through these issues. So what God is saying to us about being successful in life is, if I'm going to be successful in life, I'm going to have to be prepared to fight until it's over. That means life is going to be a struggle, and I'm going to have to hang in there with it. I'm going to have to bear with it. There's not going to be a time where I'm going to get to just relax and walk away. I'm going to have to be prepared to fight. Look at what he says. He says in these verses, but I press on. But I press on that I may lay hold but this one thing to, I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward, forward march. Say, look at your neighbor and say, forward march. Yeah, I press toward the goal. I press toward the goal. Uh, then he comes to, to these three characteristics, and I said I was going to mention to you uh, these, these, these uh, uh, three um, essence or, or three uh, principles of, of being persistent. Look at them. Uh, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. In other words, uh, I've got to have a mature mind. And if I have a mature mind, it means I'm going to think about the things that God has prepared for me. In other words, a mature mind means I understand God has a way prepared for me, and I follow that way, and that way is in my mind. That is a mature mind. In other words, you can't be complacent. You can't be complacent. God has a way. God has a path. A mature Christian mind is the kind of mind that knows that and grabs that and moves that way. So you say, man, what I need to do to be persistent, all right, I got to have a mind that thinks like God. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal it. And I said, that means that God will teach you. So you got to remain teachable. One of the ways people get messed up in life is they don't stay teachable. They think they know everything. They think they got it all together and that they don't need any more instruction. But I'm just telling you, you, you teach, we, until we go on to be with the Lord, we need to remain teachable in our life. And then nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, that just means uh, I've got to be persistent no matter what. Nevertheless, it, whether that's true or whether it's not true, I've got to go on forward regardless. Now, let me give you one other little, little shot here, and, um, and, and I want you to see this because this is so current. This is just, I could start calling names here, seriously, and, and, and really mess up uh, myself probably and, and hurt everybody. Not, not names in this building. I'm talking about big national names is what I'm talking about. All right, uh, and not political either, by the way. I know I see all of you running. No, I'm not talking about some politician. I'm talking about we as Christians. I'm talking about... Stuff. You'll see. 
Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk. Okay, uh, uh, we're mature. We give you a good example. Note the people that are like that. Pay attention to them. Model yourself after them, Paul, Paul says. For many walk of whom I've told you often, and now I tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So what are the characteristics of people that Paul says are the enemies of the cross of Christ? Because those are people he says you need to pay attention to this because these people are not your friends. These people are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. No matter how good they might look, they are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. And look at them. Whose end is destruction. What does that mean? That means that there are people out here in the Christian world pretending to care about the things of God, pretending to be uh, leaders of the gospel, teachers of the gospel, uh, bringing you to the gospel, who care nothing about the gospel. And they not only can't lead you to the gospel, they're not even concerned about the gospel. And what they actually teach you is the exact opposite of the gospel. Pay attention to this, because when you see this, then you are to know that they are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. They are detrimental. They are harmful to the cause of Christ. Not just Christians who don't know any better, but these are people who intentionally lead away from the gospel while pretending to be all about the gospel. All right, number two, whose God is their belly? What is that? It means they have an appetite. It means what they pursue is what pleases them. Right. It means that they, they're not concerned for the cause of Christ. They're not concerned for the people. They're not concerned for the, the ministry of Jesus. They are concerned about what they want out of this thing, what they can get out of this thing what they can profit out of this thing, what they can have for themselves because they are only concerned about their own appetite. Their God is their belly. And thirdly, whose glory is in their shame. This is talking about people who not only put up with shameful things, but who actually enjoy shameful things and actually encourage shameful things and actually revel and delight in shameful things. Now, I'm telling you, if you can't see the, that today, man, is that... There are, it's, it's ridiculous every moment of the day there's some, there are things that are exalted and magnified and lauded and applauded and clapped and paraded about that are pure shame yeah, yeah. that people are so excited and so happy about. Yeah. What is that? The enemies of the cross of Jesus. Paul said, I'm telling you, these are the enemies of the cross. Mm -hmm. Number four, and who set their mind on earthly things. That just means... They're not concerned about the kingdom. They're only concerned about their kingdom. They're concerned about what they can profit out of this thing. Hey, I want a big giant mansion. I want a big house. I want a bunch of toys. I want a car collection. I want a what? I mean, that's what they're interested in. And whatever it takes to do to you to manipulate you and con you and deceive you and get your money, send me your money and I'll send you a sanctified handkerchief. I mean... I mean, just stuff like that just blows my... The, what does Paul say? They are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. To be successful, you got to fight, fight, fight. I know that's not a popular word today. 
I know we're all encouraged to be sweet and to be, you know, let everybody do their own thing and don't be boisterous about anything and don't stand up. and don't. I know that's what we're encouraged to do today, but I'm just telling you that the gospel that Paul says, no, you're going to have to fight to the finish because these are enemies that are, that are going to devour you and devour your family and devour your life and devour your children, and you're going to have to fight. You're going to be successful. You got to know where you are. You got to know what strengths and weaknesses. You got to let that stuff from the past go. It's gone. It's in the past. It's over with. Let it go. And then you got to move on to what you need to focus on. There's a goal out there. There's something that you want. Focus on it. Quit dabbling in all this mess and quit allowing your life to be stolen away from you one minute at a time, wasting time on stuff that's not focused, that you're not focused on, and then be ready to fight for whatever it is that's important in life. That's successful people, according to the Apostle Paul. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. <laughs> all right.